financial information. My name is DJ. In this video, we're going to learn about the Bernstein basis for constrained curve fitting. To see why that's a good idea, imagine you were faced with this data and you'd like to fit a function to it, but you want that function to obey some constraints. For example, let's say this function has to be monotonically increasing. How might you do that? Or what if you came across data like this and you want your function to be constant over a certain range? How might you do that? Or again, what if you came across data like this and you want your function to be the same value at either ends of the range? How would you do that? Well, there are multiple ways to achieve this, but a great option is to use the Bernstein basis. If I had to sum it up in one sentence, I'd say it's a specialized basis expansion used in a regression model where the coefficients are approximately the outputs of the model at certain points. And since coefficients are easy to control, it's easy to control the model's output while fitting data. So in this video, I'll first explain what a Bernstein basis is. Then I'll show how to use them for fitting univariate data while obeying constraints. After that, I'll generalize to the multivariate case, which will make this idea more flexible and powerful. And if that isn't enough for you in the end, I'll point to my sources, which take this idea to the moon and back. Sound good? Well then, let's get to modeling. Okay, our starting point, as always, is our data. In our simple univariate case, each observation is a pair of two numbers, xi and yi. Now, before I could tell you the Bernstein basis, I need to mention, it has a requirement on our data. It requires all x values to fall between zero and one. Fortunately, that's not that limiting. All you need to do is rescale your data such that everything falls within that range. For example, you could do min-max scaling. Just make sure your mins and maxes aren't crazy outliers or else your data will get crammed into a tiny range. Cool? Okay, now, the Bernstein basis is a type of basis expansion. That means it's going to map each xi number to a vector. Then we're going to regress the y's on these vectors. If this idea sounds unfamiliar, then check out my video on linear regression and ordinary least squares. But otherwise, let's stay focused. We can define the Bernstein basis as follows. First, you need to pick a positive integer, which we'll represent with a capital M. This number will determine how many elements are in the output vector. With that, the mth output is given with this expression. It turns out if you combine all these functions, you get something which maps a number between zero and one to a vector of length m plus one, where each element is also between zero and one. To picture that, let's pick m equal to two and plot each basis function as a function of x. Okay, how about m equal to four and m equal to six? All this is showing is how selecting an m gives a different number to vector mapping. Next, let's make two observations. First, each basis function may be associated with one of m plus one equally spaced points. Second, at any point, if you were to sum the basis function outputs, you get a value of one. Very roughly, you can stitch these ideas together to recognize that when you feed a basis function a number, its output is telling you how relevant one of those m plus one equally spaced points are to the point you fed in. That'll be useful intuition to keep in mind. In fact, that observation allows us to get to the punchline of the Bernstein basis. Ready? Okay, for a given well-behaved coefficient vector theta, we get this nice property, which I will call the nice property because it's very nice. What it means is if you plug in one of those equally spaced points into the basis expansion and then take its dot product with the coefficient vector, then you'll get back approximately the coefficient of the basis function associated with that point. Okay. Not a simple sentence, so I'll say it differently. If you plug in m over capital M into the basis expansion and then take a dot product with that coefficient vector, then you'll get something close to the mth coefficient. Now, at this point, I suspect two questions. What do we mean by well-behaved and how good is this approximation? Well, to answer that, check out this. What I'm saying here is, if you think of the coefficients themselves as outputs of some continuous function f, then well-behaved means f isn't too curvy. Now, the quality of approximation depends on a few things. It depends on the curviness of f, but also on capital M, which means it depends on the length of the vector. It turns out if you hold f fixed, then the approximation will improve as m gets large. But in practice, you may find this approximation to be pretty bad. That happens if you're trying to model something complicated. In this case, you should consider the coefficients as attractors, values where your output moves towards, but can't quite reach. It can't reach them because the output function can achieve only so much curvature for a fixed m. The good news is 
A poor approximation doesn't prevent us from applying constraints. The same idea works if they operate merely as attractors. With that, I can say why this is useful for modeling. In linear regression, this dot product is our model's prediction. So this relates, in a super simple way, the model's predictions at certain points with certain coefficients. So that leads to the following idea. For modeling, first make the linear regression assumption. Yi is the dot product of our basis expansion on x with our coefficient vector plus some noise. Then form this loss, which is mean squared error plus a term that measures how much our coefficients deviate from our constraints. If that term is zero, that means our coefficients and therefore the model outputs are abiding by our rules. Now, to make this idea tangible, let's walk through an example. Before I show the data, let's first walk through how the model makes predictions. First, we need to choose that number m. Let's go with m equal to four, which gives us these basis functions. Next, let's make up some coefficients. Remember, the coefficients may be interpreted as approximate model outputs for equally spaced inputs. So that means we could plot them in the x versus y graph. The coloring here is to show the pairing of each coefficient with each basis function. Now, to make a model prediction at a point, we pass it into our basis functions giving us a vector. Then we take the dot product of that vector with our coefficient vector, giving us a single model prediction. And in fact, we can do better. Let's consider all predictions. With this view, notice how the curve gets real close to the coefficients. This is the nice property we talked about. This is why we're using the Bernstein basis. That said, you can have coefficients where the approximation is bad. In this case, the coefficients are more like attractors. If you move one, the model gets pulled in that direction. With that, we're ready to plot the data. To start, let's fit the data without any constraints. That's a good looking fit. It's clear the unconstrained Bernstein basis is pretty flexible. But now, let's make it monotonic. So the first step in meeting that constraint is to measure violations of it. That means we need to think, what is a measure of our coefficients that gives us a value of zero if our model is monotonic? but a large positive number if our function is very not monotonic. Well, since these coefficients are basically function outputs, we could penalize non-monotonicity by taking the difference between consecutive coefficients, but only if it's positive, and then summing all those up. That means our loss is this expression. Also, we've set our lambda parameter to 100, which means we have virtually no tolerance for violations. Now, if we optimize this, our model will obey our constraints and fit the data like this. Pretty cool, right? I'm not sure about you, but I find this all very satisfying. Okay, one question I expect to hear is, how do you optimize this user-defined loss function in the general case? Well, I'd like to leave the answer there intentionally open-ended. There are many approaches to optimization, and the efficient ones will take advantage of the specific form of your loss. But for practical purposes, I'll tell you I'm using PyTorch, which provides a huge amount of flexibility in optimizing losses. Okay, now, this feels like a natural place to stop, right? No, absolutely not. You can't stop at the one-dimensional case. If we want to be prepared for the wilderness, we must handle the multivariate monsters. But be prepared. The notation here gets a little heavier, so muster up some courage. If it's hard to follow, just wait. The examples afterwards should clear it all up. Ready? Okay, just like last time, we start with our data. The only difference this time is x is now a lengthy vector. Now, in the previous case, the expansion mapped from a number to a vector. In this case, it's going to map from a length d vector to a tensor with d dimensions. We'll call that tensor b of x. To calculate it, you need to decide a univariate basic expansion for each element of x. So that means when you plug those elements in, you get d vectors. Then b of x is the outer product of all those vectors. Granted, you generalize the idea of an outer product to work with more than two vectors to produce a tensor. For example, if x has length 3, then b of x will be a 3D tensor. Now, if you'd like to understand that idea precisely, read this big chunk. Here, I'm explaining the logic you'd use when implementing this idea in code. Also, I'm using the idea of broadcasting, which enables the outer product idea to work on multiple vectors. With that, we can review the nice property. Now, before you study this equation, let me describe what it's saying. First, consider the space where x lives, which is the unit cube in d dimensions. Now, consider an evenly spaced lattice of points covering that space and pick one of those points. Now, plug that point into B, giving us back a tensor in D dimensions. 
I'll call this B of the grid point. Next, let's imagine we provide a coefficient tensor of the same shape. Then we flatten B of the grid point and theta into long vectors and take their dot product. Well, that would give us a number which is close to a value within theta, the one associated with the grid point plugged into B. In other words, you can think of theta as listing out approximately all the values you'd get if you took its dot product with B of different grid points. Okay, so that covered the multivariate Bernstein basis, but we still need to bring it back to the world of modeling. Fortunately, that's easy. We just assume yi is the dot product of B of xi and theta plus some noise. Then we proceed just as we did earlier. As in the previous case, it'll be easy to control the outputs of this model by adding a term to our loss function, which penalizes values of theta. So now, are we done? No, absolutely not. I can't let this explanation float away in the abstract. I need to nail it to the floor with an example. So let's say we have this data. In this case, each xi is a length two vector, giving us the coordinates of these points. And their color tells us the yi values. Now, as you know, the goal is to fit a function to this data. Though, to explain the Bernstein basis approach, we'll need to take a little detour. So, let's drop the data for a second. The first thing we need to do is determine a univariate Bernstein basis for each element of x. So that means we need to pick m1 and m2. Let's go with 6 and 8, which corresponds to this grid over the 2D space. With that, we can form b of x. To show it, I'll pick an arbitrary x point on the left, and show you the tensor it gives us. In fact, in this 2D case, this gives us a 2D tensor, which is just a matrix. Notice, if X moves, the matrix changes. You'll notice it looks like it weighs the relevance of the whole space to a given point. Next, we need to bring in theta, which gives us enough to form model predictions. The model's prediction at X is given by creating B of X and multiplying it element-wise with theta and summing it all up but we care about all predictions. So let's view those as contour lines. Now, the nice property tells us you can consider the theta matrix as a rough approximation to those contours, or at least it's the attractive force pulling those contours around. Next, we can execute our objective, which is to fit our data. For now, let's ignore constraints and just fit the best we can according to mean squared error. Okay, not bad, but we can do better. My eyeball suggests there's some symmetry we aren't taking advantage of. So we could add that as a constraint. We just penalize theta for any deviation away from top-bottom symmetry or left-right symmetry, and we add that to our objective. Now, let's see. Oh, way better. So I hope this sells you a bit. The Bernstein basis creates an easy way to merge what the data tells you and what you assume to be true. That said, I should comment on when you should use this approach. Basically, this approach is useful for when you have strong opinions on the nature of the model's output and that isn't already captured in the data. Also, this approach is for low dimensional problems. The main reason is your parameters grow with the dimensionality of your input space. If you have 50 dimensions, you'll be handling a 50 dimensional tensor, which can't be done with any normal computer. That said, there are ways of building multi-dimensional models out of low dimensional ones. For example, generalized additive models provide such a mechanism. So if that's your use case, check that out. But before we end, I must mention my sources. I originally came across this idea from the clever folks I work with at Lyft. So in the description, I'll include the papers we pass around to get comfortable with this idea. There, you'll see this idea fleshed out super thoroughly. So if you're going to use it, make sure to check those out. And finally, thank you for your focus. If you enjoyed this video and would like to continue learning about statistics and machine learning, please like and subscribe. Content like this is the content I'll continue to make, especially if I can get your support.